to the talk. So we're going to be talking about uh, TLS and a bunch of the stuff that uh, we're talking, it's uh, from a previous talk we did at uh, OWASP OC. Um, the Orange Cow chapter has uh, regular meetings and for some of the meetings I propose a talk, Jim proposed a talk, we look at the talks, they were pretty similar when we decided to actually combine forces, do a talk. Synergy. Synergy, exactly. And, um, you know, the, the talk came up really nice and several slides after and a lot of uh, animations, we decided to actually do the same talk here. So, whenever I think about TLS encryption in general, uh, it feels like, you know, a Bond movie. And what I mean by a Bond, a James Bond movie, is the fact that when you tell people that you're using encryption, it seems that all bets are off, right? Uh, the only way that you can actually defeat encryption is to have the private key. That is not quite right. As Bruce Schneier says, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the implementation, the way the protocols are actually, you know, coded. And that's a major problem that we have, right? The encryption itself is okay. I mean, a lot of times it gets old, we have to replace it, but that's not the major problem that we have. The problems that we have that people are actually bypassing encryption are a lot simpler than uh, what would you expect. For example, uh, browsers fail open, right? Whenever there is a failure in the uh, uh, certificate, wherever it expires, wherever there's a man in the middle, what happens is the browser comes to the user and asks, hey, there's something that I believe to be wrong here. Would you like to proceed? Well, if somebody actually did the same thing you know, yesterday and it worked, probably the per there's a big chance that the person will just proceed. In fact, we find that 30 to 70% will just click through that uh, warning message, right? There's too much uh, trust in the certificate authorities. Uh, we trust the certificate authorities to vouch for us and say who we are, but we give a lot of power to them. Actually, they have so much power that can actually uh, create um, entities that ju look just like us, but are not us. We're going to talk about that in more detail later. Revocation capability does not work. There's a lot of uh, corner cases uh, with revocation. They just simply won't work for regular certificates, and that's a big problem, right? So uh, finally, some of the algorithms that we use, such as SHA-1, RC4, or RSA, they, they are kind of, you know, either at the time to retire or, you know, coming really close to a time that we have to actually move on. We're going to talk about those and uh, what's coming up next. So where are we going? Uh, Jim is going to give you an introduction on uh, SSL, TLS, HTTPS. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, certificate PIN. Next, we're going to talk about uh, perfect forward secrecy. A lot of people tell me don't say it's perfect because it's not, but it helps a lot against some types of attacks, such as passive attacks. We're going to talk about uh, strict transport security, which is a really cool header that you can use in your uh, web applications, which can help a lot to defend against some of the DNS trickery that people does uh, out there. And uh, we're going to talk about weak crypto. And finally, uh, if time allows, we're going to talk about uh, certificate revocation, uh, the CRL and uh, OCSP, the sampling uh, certification. So, secure sockets layer, SSL, TLS, HTTPS. So, you know, in a nutshell, SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer, named by Netscape in the 90s. And so TLS stands for Transport Layer Security. It's just a new name for SSL. But if you actually look at the headers for TLS 1.0, or look at some of the metadata within the actual request itself, TLS identifies itself as SSL 3.1. TLS, SSL, same thing, just a name change to deal with some Netscape copyright issues. So the whole goal of this protocol is to handle three major things, especially the way we deploy it on a web server. When you deploy SSL on a web server, anybody can anonymously make a connection to that server to establish a secure connection. And in that situation, that ver variant of TLS, which we're gonna talk about today, you, it prevents eavesdropping, confidentiality, no one can sniff your data. It prevents integrity problems, forgery, no one can modify your data. And it, and it also provides authenticity. You know you're visiting 
the right server by the virtue of the certificate authority system, which is a big pile of crap. All right, so um, <laughs> did I just say that? I apologize. All right, so, which I really think it is. It's, it's, it's been abused. We're going to look at abuse cases. If you're using TLS with mutual authentication, where you have certificates for the users in the server, it's also going to provide authentication as a fourth benefit. We're not going to focus on that. Not a lot of people deploy it that way. We're going to focus on the TLS that we see in a normal web server. So we get those three major benefits when we do it that way. So again, confidentiality, the spy can't view the data. Integrity, the spy can't change the data. And authenticity, the server you're visiting is the right one by the power vested in the certificate authority system who signs your public certificate with the CA's private certificate, which is then verified by the public certificate of all CA's within all your browsers. So that's what you get in theory. And so inside the protocol itself, TLS uses a combination of asymmetric and symmetric cryptography underneath the hood. So essentially, um, uh, SSL or TLS is going to start by establishing an asymmetric handshake in both directions. So server and client are going to exchange public keys and establish a two-way asymmetric handshake. This is a very strong, but unfortunately very slow handshake. So if, that's not, if we stop there, this protocol never would have worked. It'd been too slow to handle modern web type features. So what happens is after the asymmetric handshake is established over the TLS protocol, it drops down to symmetric uh, encryption. So the TLS protocol sets an asymmetric handshake, they exchange key material, then drop down to symmetric encryption, which is one key encryption, one shared secret, that's incredibly fast, and fearless, but not as strong. This combination of lower level cryptographic primitives is a really good idea in theory. And so why does it do this again? Again, symmetric's much faster, asymmetric slower but stronger. We get and we use asymmetric to exchange a symmetric key essentially. It's really well thought out. Um, and and the, the, whole, the whole world of TLS on a web server is really governed by a certificate authority. Again, you set up your web server. You should be creating your own public private key pair. You keep your private key in, that's right, Richard, private. You put it in HSM, preferably, in a hardware security module. You're locking it down to use it just to establish TLS. And then uh, you take your public key of your SSL, of your web server for, for TLS, for SSL, and you bring it over to a certificate authority. You say, hey, authority, can you please sign my certificate? And they say, no problem. Give me some money, show me your ID, and we're gonna you know, guarantee you're the right person who owns that server, in theory. And they will take their private key of their authority and sign your public key to your web server, give it back to you. And now, when you make a request to that web server, the web server delivers that public signed key to your browser. In your browser is every public key of every authority who verifies it was properly signed. Now, this is good. To some degree, it kind of works. But it's bad in that if anyone compromises a private key to an authority or makes mistakes in the verification of the step, then what happens? I, as an attacker, I can make a forged certificate for your web server, sign it with the authority that I've gotten my hands on, private certificate in some way, and that forged certificate that's still signed by a real authority, your browser says no problem. And this is the, this is the, and we've seen multiple vendors who are, who are CAs either abuse their power or, or actually just abuse their power. Yeah, they just abuse their power in great scale. So we'll look at this. Yes, varieties to move on. So, as a developer, when should you use HTTPS? Now, I, as an educator, I take the strong position of saying, when should you use HTTPS? Always. There are, some people debate that, and uh, I don't like to split hairs, though. We usually, people bring us in who are enterprise, large companies, who like security is a primary part of what they need to do to survive. I, I feel okay saying, use it everywhere. There are edge cases where maybe you shouldn't use it, but I'm just not a fan of trying to split those hairs. Use HTTPS, where? Everywhere. Where? Yeah, everywhere. Yeah. And by the way, uh, I want to bring uh, uh, the last bullet, which is your uh, rank, your page rank is going up if you use HTTPS. And the reason is because if you're using it, Google thinks you have something important in your site. So, you know, sometimes security is odd with speed and so on. It's not popularity. And it's just not, and, and to, and again, page rank matters to the e-commerce world in a very big way. It's, it's the heart of how they survive in a lot of ways, right? And so, um, 
It's not just a matter of supporting HTTPS, it's supporting it well. So if you're using HTTPS with old broken algorithms and older versions of protocol, you're going to get downranked actually. So how do you tell if you're getting, if you're doing SSL correctly? I'll give you a point of three references. So first we have the Mozilla server-side TLS configuration recommendations. This is this is amazing because it breaks down the it breaks down the actual uh, 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 support for browsers in three tiers. I want to support everybody. I want to support just semi-modern browsers or just super new browsers. So depending on what your goal is, there's many different specific configuration options for a variety of different open source servers. This is the best guide out there by far for your own configuration. OSAP is done by OWASP Germany. This is the most detailed analysis tool I've seen from the SSL expert who wants to break down the protocol. And I hate to mention a, a, a non-commercial, a non-open source vendor, but this is a free service. It's so far ahead of any other service. It's the work of Ivan Ristic. It lets you put in a, one. It lets you put in one of your public web servers, and it does a very detailed analysis of how good your SSL and TLS configuration is. And this service is so far ahead of everybody else who does it. This has become the de, de facto standard in SSL analysis. I highly recommend you use it. And so... What's was uh, at the uh, Exactly. It just, it, it's, it's amazing, and it's like when a new... When something new happens in the world of TLS, like Poodle... Yes. Like SSL Labs, okay, the next day. He, Ivan doesn't sleep. I'm pretty sure there's a machine here. So, keep going. Yeah, keep going. So, so let's, let's go back to the basics for a second, though. Getting TLS right. We want to make sure the OS of your servers is patched up. So my question to you is, if, if you're using Apache 1.3, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Stop what you're doing, leave right now, and go update your server to Apache like 2.2 or 2.4. You'll get, <coughs> excuse me, OpenSSL will automatically be updated, and it will solve a lot of problems you know, just by virtue of using an actually up-to-date and you know, non-owned server. So. Sorry to be a little sensational like there. It's not really my, my personality to go out there like that, but this is one, so I'll do it. All right, so let's look at the different versions of the protocol here. So SSL 1 and 2 is just broken. Don't use it. SSL 3, we've known it's got a problem for a long time, but the Poodle class of attacks came out recently and, and put the nail in the coffin. There's no reason to support SSL 3 from a security point of view. It's, it's completely broken. TLS 1 is okay, TLS 1 and 1 is okay, but we really, for really righteous configuration, we want to be supporting 1, 2, and all the other goodness that we'll talk about in a few minutes. The things developers do wrong is essentially, we can sum up this whole list by saying, not using TLS everywhere. And so what I see a lot of architectures do, especially highly hit e-commerce servers, they'll do TLS between the browser and the load balancer, and everything from the load balancer deep in the network is all plain text for performance reasons. And we've seen lots of major breaches where we had malware inside the network in some way that's listening in on plain text connections, it's game over. So to, to abide by the, the, the spirit of PCI, you should be encrypting a credit card anytime you transfer it and anytime you store it. And that's everywhere across the tier of your multi-tiered web architecture. And you know, just to be snarky, another thing what goes wrong, trusting the CA system. We can't do it anymore. So we want to look at certificate pinning, which Cassie will talk about in detail, to detect when the CA system goes bad, which has been frequent and real high visible. And again, using old servers, and you know, this is basic stuff, but it still pops up on a regular basis. So go. So the, 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 one of the biggest fails we've seen is, again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about vendors. I'll give you both sides, so trust what. So back in February 2012, Trustway was selling a uh, digital protection service where they took their, they were CA as well, they are CA as well. They took the private certificate of their CA, <coughs> put it in a hardware security module, and then sold it as a data protection system. This, that's the man in the middle back in this era. Anybody who hits your network, even your people using your guest network, people using, uh, it just, and anyone who's on that network now, they can man in the middle of them, see the TLS connection, intercept it, Issue a fake certificate signed by a real CA, because trust me, it was a CA, and man in the middle of every connection in TLS. This is hardcore. I mean, th this is abusing your role as a CA. Now, to trust me's credit, they admitted their mistake. They went public that they did this. They revoked that certificate, which is debatable, but, but then they said they'll never do it again. 
that we admit that this was an error in judgment in our part, even though we made millions of dollars doing it. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> they came clean, and Mozilla had a really big debate whether to take them out or not, and they didn't because they came clean. Right? And they said something that's really telling. They said, look, we made this mistake. We're never going to do it again. But every other CA out there is doing this as well. So if you're going to pick on us, you better rule think twice about the whole system. And they were right. So blast ahead December of 2012, we see the, is that, is that a head? February 2012 to December. Yeah, that's a head. So to, later in the year, the Turkish government, Turk Trust, all of a sudden Chrome began alerting many people in Turkey that their connection wasn't private, that they were given fraudulent certificates that was still signed by a real CA. And uh, Google got all these alerts as well. What was happening? The Turkish government was issuing fake certificates to Gmail services and signing it with their CA, because Turk Trust was a CA. So the browser normally would say, hey, this is signed by a real CA. We don't care. We'll take it. But Google quietly implemented certificate pinning and detected that it was fraudulent and embarrassed the whole Turkish government. We're a NATO ally. This news went away, and the Turkish government was never banned from the browser. It just kind of went away quickly, I think, because they're a NATO ally. And, well, I guess let's, we'll talk about politics at 6 o'clock after the hard they kick on that. Right, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> so blast ahead to December of 2013. The same thing happened in France. Like a year later, the French cybersecurity agency CA began issuing fake Google certificates that were signed by the French cybersecurity agency. Richard, why would the French issue fake Google certificates that were signed by a, a bad CA and man in the middle people? What were they doing? They, they were spying on people in a stupid way. <laughs> they were not paying attention to what was happening in the world of, of CAs. They didn't see Turk Trust get popped a year ago, and they should have, because the French were worried about, let's, what were the French worried about? They were worried about, is my croissant fresh? Is my, is my croissant fresh? Is my chocolate good? Is the dance going to be good tonight? What about that art and good food and all that? They're worried about that stuff, which is pretty freaking awesome, by the way. But they weren't doing their homework around what was happening in the world of CAs. They got so embarrassed that Google, they got, they got popped so badly, they, everyone in the world, in the, in the security world, and in the, in the intelligence world knew this was not something you should be doing, they got popped by Google, and Google kicked them out of the browser and revoked them as a CA fully. <coughs> Microsoft, Mozilla, and Opera followed suit that next Monday and fully banned uh, the French government cybersecurity agency from the browser. And the French cybersecurity agency said, oh, we just had a configuration error. <laughs> Bullshit, they were stupid. So, so be careful what you do. Now, February 2014, the go-to fail era in all iOS and OSX software. And so what happened here was, look at the code real quick. We see that here's the, here's the actual code that verifies that the certificate's being signed properly for iOS and OSX. And that was not the right button, that's the right button. There we go. They had two go-to fails in a row. So this final check never happens just because of this one line of code. And now I can man the middle any OSX or iOS device for about two years because of this tiny mistake. In the morning, I think it's just an honest mistake. In the evening after the hard liquor comes out, I think it's a conspiracy theory in the back door. Who knows? <laughs> Any static analysis tool would detect that. Any static analysis tool would find this. It's just a buffer. I'm sorry. It's just a. a it's a. a, a, a basic. Uh, even a compiled GCC will find this without even flags on it. So this is such a simple mistake. To people who think it's a back door, there, there's. There's credibility to that. You mean Apple, you're not doing any static analysis across all of your o OS code? I don't think that's true. I think this is a backdoor. I hope it's not, and it does, and this is kind of irrelevant. It's still, and this is, that's just a fun, it's not irrelevant. The fact is that iOS and OS X was completely vulnerable to man the middle across the entire TLS stack for years. You know, this is, this is what we have to deal with. Heartbleed is a simple buffer overflow, best described in a cartoon. So. It's XKCD. Server, so this is the heartbeat API. Hey, server, are you there? If so, reply potato of six letters, potato. Bang, here comes a potato. Next, hey, server, are you still there? Uh, say bird in four letters. Bird. Okay, great. Hey, server, are you still there? Heartbeat API. If so, give me a hat with 500 letters. Well, there's your hat and the password and the secret key and all the proprietary information that's in RAM at that time. And this does not get logged. Anybody can anonymously scrape anyone else's a web server with a very simple attack. And behind the scenes in the Black Hat community, this was like cyber war, hardcore. I don't like to use that term, but it was. 
Every government began attacking every government. Every hacker group began attacking every government. For a good two weeks when everybody knew about this and they're racing to fix their server, it was like World War III in, in cyberspace of everybody scraping everyone's server. It was awesome to behold in the different great communities. So, we'll shift to you now, ready? Okay, okay. So. What we're going to talk about next is how do we solve this problem. All these problems we illustrate, there's a solution to all of them if you care enough to deal with it. There's certificate pinning to detect when you have a fraudulent certificate given to you by, by a web server. You've got strict transport security to force your browser to always use HTTPS for a uh, uh, for certain domain. There's forward secrecy. This is called ephemeral cipher suites. This is this is the shindizzle. This will, this will make sure that even when the private certificate of your web server is stolen, that it's not, it cannot be used to actually decrypt the data. So these movies that show, oh, the private key is stolen, now we can decrypt all the data, that's not true in the world of forward secrecy algorithms. These are ephemeral and temporary encryption keys. And again, the Microsoft configuration guidelines, this is off the chart the best administrator reference to make sure you have your own uh, server dialed in well from a configuration point of view. Well, also, an interesting guy, you know, NIST is, is not really trusted in Europe right now because of all the random number shenanigans, but the NIST, not, the NIST guidelines here, I think I just read it recently, really well thought out, it's kind of more academic and detailed, but here's a series of, of guides I would be reading to really understand TLS from a, an, from a ultra, ultra secure point of view, which is really possible today. So let's get, let's get into it. Awesome. So, uh HSTS, Threat Transport Security, what is that? That is a uh, header uh, that you put in your, uh, your application. And it was uh, released not too long ago, it was uh, November 2020, uh, 2012. And it became pretty uh, popular. I mean, I've seen uh, a lot of people talking in this conference. Uh, Caleb gave a talk and was talking about this um, the setting. And basically we, what it does is it mitigates the soft fail. In other words, that thing about your browser going to a website and trying to do first HTTP and then HTTPS, and then you know there's a man in the middle who actually puts another site, that's why it mitigates, right? Uh, so a lot of the DNS trickery that you would see, or you know, mixed content or a lot of bad behavior that shouldn't happen in the first place. This is something that protects the user, okay? So it's really for the user to know not to proceed ahead. It's about stopping that user that was going to get that message says, hey, you know, there's something wrong here. And then the user decides to move forward as, you know, 30 to 70% of the users do, do. This will hard fail, right? And say, hey, you cannot move forward because there's a problem here, right? And uh, it's uh, specific to HTTP right now. Uh, at the bottom, you see how to implement. It's just a header, as I said, which is called strict transport security. And then you put the max age, or in other words, how long this uh, setting is going to be affected. And then you have include uh, subdomains. So a couple tips on uh, how to implement this thing in order to make it work. First is that it won't work with a self-certificate. So if you're testing and you want to test with a self-certificate, it won't work, right? Uh, it won't work with IP, uh, IPs, or it won't work with uh, plain text. A lot of those things are because you don't want to create a denial of service condition, right? Somebody could actually inject a header and then your site would stop working. So, you know, there's a couple uh, of things that won't make this work properly. Um, it will work on all ports, right? And uh, whenever you deploy the first time, you should deploy with a short duration so you can, you know, make some tests and make sure that everything works. Um, to revoke, this uh, setting, what you do is simply is you put the max age equals zero, and then it goes back to you know the normal behavior before that. Uh, a couple other uh, consider, um, uh, considerations is to include all subdomains. In other words, it, I'm not talking about putting the uh, uh, all subdomains directive, but really to put in all your subdomains that you have. And the reason is because somebody might go to the main page of your website, but sometimes people might go to a subdomain instead, right? And you want to be protected in every single entry point. So you should use uh, everywhere you can. Uh, there's some good news, uh, which is uh, you can use this in your um, HTTP header, or you can actually preload this in the browsers. So uh, in the next couple of slides, you're going to see uh, some data on how to preload um, 
this setting uh, in the browser uh, for Firefox and uh, Chrome. Uh, one of the things about this preloading is that you have to uh, at least uh, set the max age to a certain number. Uh, I think it's uh, eight weeks. Be 18 weeks, thanks. 18 weeks because you really want to uh, make it you know, long enough for them to, to put in the browser. Uh, there are a couple problems with this. One of the potential attacks here is, okay, so you have this max age, uh, but if, the, if there's a man in the middle and the, the person can actually control the NTP, the net, network time protocol, the person could actually set you in the future and make it, you know, the, the, uh, the setting expire, and then you're back to the HTTP first, uh, you know, attempt to the site, and then the HTTPS and so on. Um, most browsers are already supporting this, so it's pretty widely deployed. You see that uh, a lot of sites such as uh, Google and uh, others are actually using. Uh, Internet Explorer uh, already committed, so it, uh, IE 12 should have it. And uh, as I mentioned, here's how you do to preload uh, things to, uh, to uh, the browsers. So the next topic I want to talk about is certificate pinning. So Jim already mentioned uh, certificate pinning, which is a way to actually uh, make sure that if somebody actually fakes a uh, certificate, but is actually vouched by a valid CA, so we're talking about the nation state type of attack, you can actually say, well, this is not the certificate that I'm looking for. I'm not going to allow the communication to, to move on. Um, there are several ways that you can do this. Here's one of the ways that you can actually pin the headers. And here's how it works in big pictures. So basically, you have several certificate authorities out here, right? There are like hundreds of certificate authorities. Certificate authorities are the ones who actually provide you the certificate they use in your website. What you have to do in order to use a certificate is you have to prove you're, you, know, you are who you claim you are. Uh, there are a number of ways that you can do. Uh, the cheap certificates, for example, you just send an email, right, uh, request certificate, certificate, they will send you uh, the data back to the admin at that domain, right, and uh, from there you can get your certificate. Um, once you get the certificate, you install and use it, right? But if you want to get a certificate for a domain that you don't own, let's say I want to get for google.com, I cannot uh, get that from a uh, CA, technically. So the only uh, way that I could actually fake one is actually if I go and I do a self-signed certificate that says, hey, you know, uh, I am Google says I. So the way it's going to work is whenever somebody actually does a request, to a website uh, site, they get the certificate, they go get the certificate store, and then they compare the certificate, see if the certificate is vouched by a valid uh, certificate authority that is actually in the certificate uh, store, right? And if it is valid, they proceed and everything is good. If the same thing happens with somebody who is actually saying, hey, I'm Google, right, and I have a self signed certificate, you're going to have a warning in the browser that won't allow you to go uh, and you know move forward. This all looks good. However, there are some problems here. One is that if any certificate authority gets breached, it's actually a problem for you. This is kind of funny, because I used to look at the newspaper and see a lot of uh, certificate authorities being breached, and I would say, well, good thing that I got you know, a responsible one, a, you know, one that does the job that they should do in order to secure things. But the problem is that any certificate authority could actually create certificates on your behalf. And that's a big problem, you know, the entire flaw on this, the way this thing was designed. So how can we actually um, uh, protect ourselves from all this, you know, over 100 certificate authorities that are uh, out there that could be breached and maybe up to no good, as Jim said, right? Let me show you how this would work first uh, with uh, a, a forged uh, certificate once the certificate authority decides to, to uh, cooperate with that. Basically, uh, what you have here is a uh, evil certificate authority that decide to send a uh, certificate to somebody saying, yes, you are Google and I will vouch for that. Right, then the uh, app comes, compares that you know, certificate that was provided with the certificates that are in the certificate store, and if somebody in the certificate store said, hey, you know, this is valid, then you are all, all good. Right, so here's where uh, pinning comes in place. 
so with pinning, what you do is, if you're doing pinning on first use, you do the same thing that you were doing before, right? You compare certificates, you see if they are good, right? And then the next thing you do is you pin the certificate, right? So what's going to do, what's going to happen right now is that um, all the certificate stores are not going to be in the picture anymore. What the browser is going to do is really compare the certificate that is being provided with the certificate uh, that uh, they have pinned. So, for example, if I go to the you know website that I want and I compare the certificates, they're going to be identical or they're going to have the same properties. So, pinning is good. You can proceed. However, if there's a forged certificate that was provided by a evil certificate authority and you try to do the same thing, the uh, properties of that certificate are not going to be matched, right? And that's how you actually uh, prevent, uh, you know, uh, breach from other security authorities. Uh, in summary, what you're doing re here is not um, um, eliminating the problem, but what you're doing is you have this uh, big um, uh, attack surface, which are all the certificate authorities out there, and you're just minimizing to one that you trust, or maybe two. So implementing this is kind of tricky. So I want to give you some tips on how to do it. Uh, first thing is that this is a recipe. I mean, PIN is a recipe for a self-inflicted denial of service. So what you want to do is really make sure that you plan ahead very well before you implement this. One of the things I would recommend is actually to set two different certificates that your uh, mobile application could use, and they should be from different uh, certificate authorities, and they should expire in different times, right? So those are good things to actually do when you're implementing this. The other thing is if you're talking about a mobile application, you don't want to do the pinning on first queues. In other words, you don't want to have that first uh, time that you traverse the internet to get a certificate from a supposedly good server to get back to you. What you want to do is actually use the pinning in the installation application that you ship to uh, Google Play or to Apple. So you can actually uh, do a uh, out of band, uh, you know, pinning, which is a, a lot more secure. Uh, this uh, pinning is also a headache for pen testers. So once you have pinning, it's a lot harder to pen test things, right? You cannot go in the, you know, put your burp certificate and expect things to work because that's exactly, you know, the type of things that pinning are trying to, uh, to prevent. So there are a couple of tools that uh, are out there. They have been uh, presented at Black Hat. So for example, the kill switch or the SSL bypass tool, which are going to help you to actually test things. Uh, you can also disable things altogether and provide to the pen testers a application that has been disabled, or actually create a test certificate if you want. Uh, those uh, options have you know, pros and cons. It's really up to your uh, organization to decide what's the best one to use or you know, the, the one that you, you trust the most. So, um, pinning is something that uh, is right now in draft form for uh, web applications. There is a uh, draft which is in version 21, should expire on uh, April 8th, that uh, Chris uh, Evans uh, from Google is actually uh, leading. And uh, it looks a lot like the HSTS uh, directive that we've seen before. So, it has, you know, the max age, and then you have the pin, the type of uh, a hashing algorithm that you're going to use. Right now, they only accept uh, SHA-256. In version 19, they were still accepting SHA-1, but they decided to upgrade things, right? And uh, there were a couple of things that I actually learned when I was uh, reading the RFC. For example, in order to implement plain pinning, what you really want to do the first time is actually put in uh, reporting mode, which this thing provides, right? So what you want to do for your uh, mobile applications is actually put something like a, uh, a, a testing mode where you can see how many people would actually be blocked, right? And the reason and all the information so you can report back to your servers and have a good feel of, you know, uh, how you're doing this before you deploy to everybody and you might shoot yourself on the foot, you know, with, uh, uh, with your uh, mobile application. So uh, the next topic is forward secrecy. Forward secrecy is about uh, trying to avoid some uh, of the passive attacks that are out here, and uh, Jim is going to talk about it. 
So to understand the importance of perfect forward secrecy, we have to go back a couple of years. We need to look at uh, different algorithms that were used underneath the hood of TLS that really depended on the private key of your server to do the encryption. And so the best, the best way to do TLS is you have option of the authority build certificates for you, but I wouldn't do that. I'd build my own certificates and just bring your public certificate to the authority and they'll sign it and give it back to you. And then rock and roll. Older algorithms underneath the TLS protocol, when they negotiate which algorithm they're going to use to do the encryption, that symmetric encryption is, is that key used to the encryption is derived from the, the private key on your server. So if you're like a highly resource threat agent, like nation state level combatants, and, and they see you doing TLS and they want to get to your plain text, first of all, they'll just drop malware on your machine and, they're, and you're good to go. Now, if they can't do that, and they're just really trying to take data from the network, what they'll do is they'll record that data and put it in big storage, record, it may take them years to crack the key, they'll record, 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 maybe crack the key after a couple of years, and then any TLS connection or SSL connection made by that server is now reversible. That's a big problem. <clears throat> enter, forward enter perfect forward secrecy or forward secrecy, otherwise known as ephemeral cipher suites, temporary cipher suites. So if you use older ciphers, when I steal the key, I can decrypt everything. So perfect forward secrecy says that a client and server in a conversation or peers in a conversation, they negotiate secrets through a temporary key exchange that has nothing to do with the keys on your server. It's just temporary for that connection. And sometimes they change rapidly as well. So with perfect forward secrecy, when a highly resourced threat agent records the ciphertext traffic, it doesn't help them ever get to your plain text. Right? Let's look at this animation one more time. Yeah, look creepy. Look creepy. All right. So with PFS, again, recording the ciphertext is not going to help. It's not derived from the actual private key. So what does this look like? So these are different, remember, TLS is a combination of asymmetric crypto and symmetric crypto. We have the asymmetric part of the handshake, this is ephemeral to the helmet, that's a key exchange algorithm, it's asymmetric crypto. And once they <coughs> agree upon the key, they fall back to AES uh, loss counter mode, which is really good AES with integrity built in. This is one of the best ciphers out there right now for really good security. And most browsers support this really well now. We've had this for years, but once the Snowden affair showed up, Google, and Google was really hit by this. They found out that uh, one of the agencies recording <coughs> data between data centers, and knowing it, they, in theory, they got really upset, and they rapidly rushed to support these. So TLS has been broken for a decade, but in the last year or two, all these little things have been rushing into the standard, and it's now widely supported across the web application infrastructure, web application ecosystem. These are older versions of TLS ciphers that are just old school RSA with you know AES, and so there's nothing ephemeral about it. If I get to your private key, I can crack all the data that you've ever made with that suite with that server. Cool. Brian? It's easy to support this. It's just a configuration switch on your web server. And most modern, all modern up-to-date browsers support this well now. It's the problem we're trying to support XP you know, on service pack three, this is where these algorithms do, are not supported. But if you're using XP and, and you're really depending on, if you're using XP and IE6 and you're really depending upon that, you got big problems. <laughs> awesome. So uh, in the last slide, Jim was showing uh, the cypher suites, right? And those are big strings that a lot of time confuse a lot of people because they are not very uh, uniform. Let's break it down. So yeah, let's break it down, right? So here's one of the strings that uh, you can use, right? So what it does is the first part here, you have the key exchange, right? So here you have the MF ephemeral Diffie-Hellman elliptic curve uh, algorithm, which is the key exchange. Most of the times, <coughs> what people are using today is the RSA. So here in the bottom, you see actually a table, right? With uh, the most popular algorithms, right? And then uh, a star where it's popular, and the uh, arrow uh, pointing down where it should be phased out. The bad news is that a lot of the algorithms that are popular should be phased out right now. And that's exactly what I want to talk about in this uh, next slides that I have. A couple other things that you see uh, RSA, there's RSA for key exchange and uh, for uh, authentication as well. So it's used in different ways. 
So uh, when we talk about forward secrecy, we're really talking about key exchange here, right? Uh, not authentication. Um, there's the uh, asymmetric algorithm here, and then there's uh, actually the symmetric algorithm with the length, the mode that Jim just talked about, and uh, the key exchange. And then in the second line, you see the same thing, but because you use uh, different modes, you see someone saying uh, American, the other one, to exchange. Just a note about this. this is, I think it's interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. We have like eight old school algorithms are using AES 128. That's 128 in some ways is stronger than 256. That's a whole different debate. So this is a good choice. You're using CDC mode. That provides encryption confidentiality, but it doesn't provide integrity. If someone who did place a ciphertext, we have no way of knowing that. So they're using a hash to do as part of a Mac algorithm to also provide integrity. And this is kludgy. It works, but it's kludgy. So in the modern era, we're now shifting to AES GCM mode. I believe it's pronounced gloss counter mode, which is one of the first generations of AES algorithms that provide confidentiality, can't get to you, not, can't get to the data, but it's also integrity, where it's a, the, Mac, the Mac process is built in, so if someone tries to mess with your ciphertext, you're going to know about it right away, and it's built in with the internet algorithm, instead of doing it in a kludgy way. So this is right on a lot of levels. This wasn't available to us until very recently. So. And by the way, uh, GCM is the way to go. Uh, CVC has a lot of problems. It, and uh, I'm just saying because it's not in the table below. But uh, because of CVC, we had Poodle, we have Beast, we had a lot of you know issues uh, you know in the past. So definitely something that is also phasing out that we used to be very popular, right? So moving on. So uh, one of the things that you should avoid, the things that you should move away. The first one is actually SHA-1. Right, SHA-1 is actually something that uh, Google is actively trying to make your, uh, uh, give warnings to your users if you're using your certificates right now. And 90% of the sites out there are using. The good news is that you just need to get a new certificate from your uh, certificate authority. And most of the times, unless you have something really weird going on with your uh, TLS implementation, you should be okay. Um, this table that I got from uh, Bruce Schneier uh, blog, is very compelling. It really tell you, tells you why you should move away from SHA-1. There's a lot of collisions for SHA-1, and given the, uh, the fact that you can just go to AWS and buy computing power in order to uh, break uh, you know, encryption and, uh, uh, you know, in general, uh, what he did is actually calculated how much it would cost, you know, and uh, given the fact that the price of computing power is going down, uh, over time, you know, uh, how much it would cost in order to break things. And you can see that, you know, by 2018, it's going to talk, uh, cost $173,000, and that's uh, within reach for organized crimes. So what Google is doing, actually, is trying to phase out putting, you know, uh, alerts to the users, so users will know that, you know, the strategy is using SHA-1, uh, up to the point that in uh, January 2017, they were just but the you know big acts and say hey you know this is not a trusted site anymore, so you know call to action for everybody is to start moving to uh, SHA two, otherwise your users are going to start looking and saying hey you know there's something wrong here. Uh, RSA, RSA is an algorithm that is just fine, but really it's one that makes you you know you wonder how long it's going to be around. It has been around forever, right? It doesn't support forward secrecy, so all the Passive type of attacks that we're talking about, where uh, you know people just save all the information from the network for one day when the certificate is actually uh, you know breached and you know the private key is out there, somebody can actually decrypt, right? This is the kind of things that afford secrecy will actually prevent for you. Uh, so you know, good reason to move away from uh, RSA. The other one is that. It was never listed in the uh, in the list for uh, that the government used the uh, NSA and the NIST approved list, right? So it, it, at least for me, it always makes me wonder if they know something that we don't know about RSA, right? So uh, maybe it's you know a good thing to actually move to to newer uh, type of uh, algorithms. Uh, Jim was saying uh, the size of the key and uh, whether the you know the uh, algorithm is symmetric or asymmetric. And you can see here that the size of the keys for uh, algorithms such as RSA, right, that don't uh, 
rely on the elliptic curve, you know, grow exponentially. While the other ones, they uh, rely on the ECC or elliptic curve, they don't grow as much, right? So the entire idea, the entire conception of RS, uh, RSA is also something that people should, you know, wonder about whether it's, it's a good thing. Uh, the last part of the talk is about uh, certificate revocation. And yeah, let just me check time, okay? So certificate revocation is something that really doesn't work too well, right? There are a couple of uh, problems with it. One is that in order to get the propagation and the servers to actually update things, it can take up to 10 days. Um, the browsers, even if things work well, the browser will still fail open. There's that soft fail policy, which, you know, we leave the uh, ultimate decision of whether to proceed or not to the users, right? And uh, you have other, uh, you have different types of uh, ways you can revoke certificates. One of them is the certificate revocation list, CRL, and there's uh, OCP. If you go to uh, OCSP, you actually can uh, intercept uh, the, the calls, which we're going to see uh, pretty shortly, right? So uh, this is so, you know, it's such a bad state that a lot of the browsers decide to just ignore uh, certificate revocation for the uh, standard um, uh, certificates and only uh, work with uh, EV, the extended validation certificates. The extended validation certificates are the ones that turn your, uh, your uh, address bar green, cost a lot of mo more money, and uh, the certificate authorities do a lot more uh, work in order to really see who you are. So, certificate revocation list. This is an idea that does not scale, and that's one of the main problems, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Just consider this graphic here, right? Uh, this is a certificate revocation list in uh, 2007, right? And then there's a certificate revocation list in 2013. And we're not even talking about Heartbleed, where a lot of people actually... Huh? That, that was before Heartbleed. So yeah, it's really... You know, if you have to download uh, a, a revocation list that can get up to that size because you can do like incremental uh, downloads and so on, it, it, you know, it can significantly slow down everybody on the internet. So OCSP is the, um, the alternative here. Uh, OCSP works in, different way, uh, in a different way. Instead of uh, giving you all this list of certificates, it actually will just uh, make one single call about the certificate you just got. So here you got a certificate, you know, you went to a web, web server, you got the certificate for that web server, then you go to the OCSP responder, which is a separate, can be a separate entity than the certificate authority, right? And then you go to the um, OCSP responder, and using port 80, the, you know, the machine asks, okay, is this a certificate I can trust? And then using port 80, uh, you know, the OCSP responder actually says, yeah, and then it signs the message. There's one big problem here, which is privacy, right? If uh, all this communication is being done on port 80, you know, everyone is seeing what kind of website you're going to, and this is something that you might not want, to, you know, to happen. So, um, that was one of the problems with the OCSP. There's another one, which is the man in the middle type of attack. If, um, if you get the server, uh, the certificate, and then you try to go to uh, the OCSP and there's a man in the middle, actually there's a, a possibility that this man in the middle can actually replay the message saying, hey, the certificate is just fine. Which is kind of funny because they just said that that message is actually signed. And in the past, that message used to have a nose, but then uh, in order to scale, they start making files and putting CDNs and then they took out the nose and then, you know, replay attack happens. So that's one of the attacks that is possible. Lastly, uh, as we mentioned before, if uh, the application wants to go to the OCSP responder and then this message is actually dropped in the network, the browser will fail open. So you also have a problem right there. So the solution here is something called uh, OCSP statement. And uh, it solves some of the problems, such as the privacy. What you do now is instead of you going to the OCSP responder, uh, the website that, is, uh, that owns the certificate is the one who goes. And then it gets, 
the uh, response and actually staples with the certificate. So all you have to do if the website supports uh, OCSP stapling is to go to the website and you're going to get both. So there's no privacy problem because you're just going to one website, right, and solves a lot of uh, the other problems that, that uh, we've seen. So, conclusion. So we talk about several of the uh, problems that we have with TLS today and uh, some of the solutions. So really what we want to do here is a call for action, right? There are a couple of things that should be implemented. Number one is about uh, HSTS. Uh, it's super easy to implement, to put this header, right? And uh, as uh, Caleb, uh, Caleb actually talked yesterday, it's probably one of the best uh, ROIs that you can have in order to combat a lot of the DNS trickery in many of the middle type of attacks they're out there. And just a note on this, there, and there, here's the main flaw of HSTS. It's not the flaw of HSTS, it's just the, the reality. When someone opens up a browser and they go to hit your site, they're usually going to type in yoursite.com. So the first hit is over HTTP. Then you get a redirect, then you redirect to TLS, then you get strict transport security. What's wrong with that? The first connection is HTTP, and if the attacker is an observer, it's too late. They own you. So, you really do HSTS right, and only about 1,200 sites do this today. You have to go to Chrome, first deliver HSTS headers and get it right, and go to the Chromium project like we specified, and register your site to get preloaded in the browser. Now, you have strict transport security, so when someone downloads a brand new browser, they type in yoursite.com, it's preloaded, so the first hits get switched, the first hits TLS, then the strict transport security headers come down, and then you're strictly locked to HSTS for that many seconds. Now you never have an HTTP connection as part of that handshake. Only about a thousand sites do this, but if you really want to get this right, that's what you have to do. And strict transport security is the, the protocol that drives that, that capability. Yes. Okay. Yep. And the, the second thing we also recommend is actually to start using pinning or considering using pinning for your mobile applications. Right? Pinning reduces that attack surface. You don't want to be exposed just because one of the you know one, over 100 uh, certificate authorities out there was a breach or is up to no good. You know that could affect your website. Uh, as I mentioned, pinning is in a draft uh, format uh, right now for a uh, a uh, RFC for uh, web applications as well. And uh, you know we, we expect that to, to move forward. It's available in the experimental headers, which work pretty well. They're available in Firefox and in Chrome today. So if you're like an organization where you're forcing users to use a certain browser on your intranet, man, you could you could be doing web-based printing web-based pinning reliably for intranet applications where you control the browser today, and that's a big deal. And we'll see that more available on the internet as time goes on. Yep. And, um, you know, OCSP sampling, as we mentioned, something that we also believe, in, you know, has better privacy, you know, more efficient and safer. Uh, and the last thing is actually uh, forward secrecy, which, you know, uh, mitigates a lot of the passive attacks of people just saving things up to a point that they can actually decrypt things in the, in the future. Right. Lastly, we have to plan to move away from uh, RC4, uh, RSA, SHA-1, those algorithms are, you know, pretty much done. I mean, definitely for RSA, uh, for RC4 and SHA-1, RSA, I believe, it's next in the list. If you want to be a little bit ahead of the curve, start thinking about, you know, uh, using uh, forward secrecy. So we'll go back one step. Uh -huh. Hit the button. Hit the button. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Ding. <coughs> <laughs> we'll have next time. We were discussing, like, he would give the talk and I would do, like, modern interpretive dance about the talk. Well, we decided yeah. against it, so. Anyways. Anyway, well, thanks for everybody. Um, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, the video on that photo we just got picked, uh, but had a certificate to also make thing. One more time, who? Go go the area of in-flight internet in Texas. Oh, I saw that. So it's not just uh, uh, countries doing this. So go go was man the middling all TLS connections 
on, uh, on other flights. aircraft flights because they want to improve user experience. <laughs> That's the biggest pile of garbage I've ever heard. They should be ashamed of themselves for doing that. They should be fined heavily for doing that. So I don't, I'm really curious of how that will evolve. In flight wireless go go is randomly everybody to improve user experience. They got their hands on a product certificate and started using it for. It wasn't signs. It was self signs. What's that? It was self signs. Oh, self sign? Yeah. So, so, so you can no longer use TLS without getting warning in the browser on, this, on the service. What the hell were they thinking? Like, why would any organization do this so blatantly with no shame? I have no idea. This, you have limited bandwidth. You have a choice on a plane, right? that's why. I'm sorry? You have limited bandwidth and you put the proxy server on a plane. I mean, you don't do that over TLS, though. You're, I mean, you just don't do that. That's what you are telling me. That's why. It's 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 all your customers in a, in a, it just it makes no sense for any kind of reason. Well, that maybe it's like the, the Chinese use self signed service for rather than printing SSL service uh, because that way people know if they click through they're under surveillance that keeps them working. Well, back to code, though. That's like violating the privacy of your most critical apps as a service. Violating your privacy, B-Y-B-A-A-S, new SaaS provider. So, I, I don't buy the arguments. Is Daniel, is it, or who is that? Oh, Ali. I, mean, I, just, I, I, mean, I just don't buy I, the I'm not justifying it. I'm just telling you that's what happens in the real world. Fair enough. Question. Uh, how does the improvement uh, go along with the places where this inspection is being deployed by the employer? Well, it shuts it down. Well, actually, it depends. It depends. If the employer is depending upon an external CA, the pin will shut this down. If the employer has an internal CA um, and it's for internal services, they're going to be able to manage them with you no problem. But if you're getting between your browser and an external service, and, and they, what they commonly do is they drop a private, a private CA into your machine so they can handle everything, that stops working when, when applications are thin. And so this is a huge debate across telecoms and organizations. This is a way to do HTTPS. So it actually works, so, so it can't be lawfully intercepted. So I'm very, I'm very curious of how this will play out. But it, it, again, you want to stop nation states from handling your critical business apps when your users are traveling overseas? This is what you have to do to shut it down. And the, and the, the implications haven't played out yet. We'll see. Well, you look at it from a perspective. I mean, the United States is one thing, but the borders are regulated and you don't want to allow it to access uh, the pornography during uh, your uh, work. So there's other ways to do that, though, besides manability and only to less than extra. Can you suggest that the current implementations of Chrome and Firefox for Chrome allow uh, installed users to locally install it in their own area? If there are prep settings, you can turn that off, but right now it's kind of a word of compromise. Because that's tofu pain if you're using hard coded. A priori painting where you actually have a copy certificate put in the mobile app that stops working. Oh, yes. But if you're doing tofu painting, trust on first use. Okay, so. There are, there are, uh, not both, they both work. For example, you have a phone draw post in your machine, not the mobile app, and it won't work. So, as an organization, you're deploying your web server. Some people choose not to use word secrecy in these things because they want to do data inspection. So, I prefer to use services that have really, really good <coughs> configuration so it guarantees the, the confidentiality and integrity of my connection. That depends what you're trying to accomplish. So yeah, uh, we're out of time. So um, you know, if there are any other questions, we're going to be outside. Thanks.